Little Johnny Goes to the Fair. Written by Samuel E. Sanchez. Narrated by Frank Block. Chapter 1 crowed out the rooster. Little Johnny's eyes instantly popped open. He sprang out of bed and darted to his parents' room. Mommy, Papa, get up! It's Maricopa Fair Day, and you promised to take us, cried little Johnny. As his father awakened from a deep sleep, he yawned and stretched. His mother shook herself into consciousness and replied, Little Johnny, did you even sleep last night? Yes, Mommy, I slept and dreamed about our trip to the fair, he replied. Come on, Papa, you know that your word is your bond, and you already promised. A daddy can't break his word to a son. It's against the rules, Papa, he blurted out as he jumped on the bed. Seeing how excited little Johnny was brought a huge smile to Papa's face. Okay, okay, son. You still have to get ready, eat breakfast, finish your chores and get in the truck before we can be on our way to the fair, said Papa. Okay, Papa, replied little Johnny as he hopped off the bed. Immediately and without a word, little Johnny ventured out to fulfill Papa's list. First, he jumped in the shower, washed his hair, brushed his teeth, cleaned his face and body. He then thoroughly rinsed off all the lather and finally dried himself entirely. Next, he put on his undergarments, jeans, and shirt. Finally, he was sure that everything had been accomplished and he ran to the kitchen. The sweet smell of pancakes, hot butter, and hot syrup was in the air. Oh boy, pancakes! It is my lucky day, thought little Johnny. I am going to eat a hundred flapjacks, he declared. In the hallway, he met his twin. Well, it was almost a perfect day, he said to himself. As his sister Betty Sue heard his comment, she replied to him, You ain't my prize pig either, Johnny. The two laughed and fought each other to be first at the table. Finally, little Johnny pushed through with a desperate thrust and was able to sit down just a split second before Betty Sue. You see, Betty Sue, boys are faster, stronger, and better than girls, said Johnny as he nodded his head. Does that apply to me too? inquired his mother. With a sheepish grin on his face, little Johnny answered, Oh no, Mama, you were a mother. You were never a girl. (laughs) Boy, you're going to eat those words, and sooner than you think, said Papa with a laugh. Right after the prayer, Mama served everyone a tall glass of milk. Of course, Papa had coffee too. Mother then placed a stack of flapjacks, the height of the Empire State Building, right in the middle of the table. Right next to the flapjacks were piping hot bottles of syrup, and the smell filled the room. As everyone took in the aroma, little Johnny's mouth began to water. While intoxicated by the smell, He did not even notice how beautifully arranged the table was laid out. There was a large bowl of scrambled eggs, perfectly browned toast, and a flask of orange juice. His excitement blinded his senses. Everyone enjoyed the breakfast. It was usually the best part of the day, and this day did not fail to be exceptional. Of course, the exciting discussion added to the morning's exhilaration. Papa made his usual jokes poking fun at the animals. Mama spun her yarns about Grandma and Grandpa serving in foreign lands, preaching the gospel, and bringing people to Christ. Little Johnny and Betty Sue just took it all in. The morning meal was always special, and only supper was ever better. Or perhaps lunch. Okay, second thing on Dad's list has been accomplished. Two to go, he thought to himself. He then pushed the plate from his presence. Sir, may I be excused to do my chores? Asked little Johnny of his father. Yes, son, and don't forget that the horse's hooves need cleaning, and the goats need fresh water, replied his father. Okay, Papa, said little Johnny as he darted out the door. 
That boy is more wound up than a cat in a room full of rocking chairs, said Papa. Do you blame him, Papa? asked his wife. Mama, may I be excused too? asked Betty Sue. Yes, my dear. Don't forget to clean the bathrooms, fix the beds, put the clothes in the wash, and vacuum, instructed Mama. I will, Mama. You can count on me, said Betty Sue as she kissed her father's cheek. Huh, Daddy's girl, said Mama. You know it, Mama, replied Betty Sue. That's my girl, said a smiling father. As Mama cleared the table, Papa took a moment to read the daily paper. Says here the price of cotton has gone up, about 10% per bushel. That may help us pay down the combine, honey, said Papa. That's great, dear. It will be wonderful not to have that bill hanging over our heads, replied Mama. Look at this! What a great find! screamed Papa. What is it, Papa? asked his wife. The paper says that today is free entrance for veterans and their families. I guess that stent in the Navy is finally paying off, proudly declared Papa. You were so dashing in your dress blues, dear, replied Mama as she finished cleaning the table. Well, off to work. I better make sure that boy ain't overwhelmed, said Papa as he finished the last of his coffee. As Papa jumped into the truck, he could see little Johnny working, feeding the chickens. Once little Johnny finished cleaning the coop, he placed their waste matter into the compost bin. Then he changed their water. Finally, after refilling the food receptacles, he stepped back and mentally checked his work. Is this how Dad would have done it? He questioned himself. Yep, off to the goats, he said aloud. His father continued to watch from afar. A gleam of pride shined from his face. Little Johnny was becoming a fine young man. At the same time, his twin Betty Sue had just finished cleaning the toilet. That ought to do it, she expressed to herself. Now that is a fine job there, Betty Sue. The bathroom is clean enough for preparation day. Our king would be proud, exclaimed Mama. Your work gets better every week, my sweet, Mama said as she embraced her young prodigy. Thank you, Mama. I only want to make you proud and to honor Papa, stated Betty Sue. Meh, 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 cried the baby goats as little Johnny entered the pen. He reached for his favorite little white kid. Oh, little girl, you're my prize goat. Next fall at the fair, you're going to win first place. So I better take care of you. Otherwise, there's going to be heck to pay, Johnny said as he glanced into the kid's beautiful gray eyes. Man, you're so cute. If you don't win, the judges have to be blind, he expressed. Then, returned the goat back to the ground, and she scrambled to reach her mother's warm body. Meh! cried the goat from under her mother's belly. She continued to stare at Johnny until she fell asleep. Johnny reached for the rake and made a pile of all the uneaten hay, animal waste, and other organic debris that was on the floor. Again, he collected the pile and placed it into the compost bin. This time, he overfilled it. Man, these little guys make a lot of poo, he commented. Next, he changed the goat's water and snuck them some snacks, a dried apple apricot mix. It was no wonder the goats loved Johnny. Oh, what's next, thought Johnny. Oh yeah, I need to take care of the dogs, he said. Inside the house, Betty Sue was just placing the soap into the last batch of clothes. Whew, that ought to do it, she said to herself. Next, she reached into the closet and removed the vacuum cleaner from its resting place. After plugging the cord into the socket, she turned the vacuum on. Then she cleaned the living room rug. The rug was not too dirty, since they were vacuumed twice a week. As she finished the floor she noticed a small tray on the left end table. On the tray was a single chocolate cookie with a note which stated, You're doing a fine job. I am proud of you, Mom. A smile of accomplishment could be seen on the young girl's face as she brought the cookie to her mouth.
Good job, boy. Way to stack those bales, cried old Papa as little Johnny stacked them in the barn. Keep up the great work, and I'll be back to check up on you later, Papa stated. Okay, Papa, I still have several more to stack, and then I must feed the horses, he replied to his father. His dad disappeared. Johnny took a deep breath and said, Here we go again, and he stacked the bales. Hey there, sweetheart. Could you use some help? inquired Mama. Mother walked on the other side of the bed, reached for the corner of the sheet, and waved the sheets in the air. Together, they tucked the sheets in place, creating perfect hospital corners. Should I get a corner, Mama? asked Betty Sue as she laughed. Don't worry about it. I do not think that Dad will do an inspection today, my dear, replied Mama, smiling. Well, it looks like we're done, Mama. I guess girls are faster than boys. And better, too, said Betty Sue. You know that's right, replied Mama. Now the better pair have to wait for the boys, said Betty Sue as she laughed. Just as Johnny had finished the chores, his father walked into the barn. Well, it looks like we are finally finished. I left the field with the water on, so remind me to call your uncle and ask him to turn it off. Otherwise, you'll have the pool you keep asking me for, said Papa, joking. Yes, sir, replied little Johnny. The pair walked up to the car. Papa climbed into the driver's seat, and little Johnny got in behind him. Typical. The men have to wait on the ladies, said Papa. As Mama and Betty Sue exited the house, they walked up to the old Cadillac. When Papa saw the pair, he exited the vehicle, walked around to the front of the automobile, and held the doors open for the ladies. That is how a gentleman is supposed to act, Johnny. You are no gentleman, said Betty Sue. That's okay, Betty Sue, because you are not even close to being a lady, replied Johnny. Now you two stop that. That is no way for Christian children to act, demanded Mama. Yes, Mama, the twins said in unison. As Papa turned the key, the ignition turned over, and a thought of horror crept into Johnny's mind. Oh, no, screamed Johnny. Everyone, I am so sorry. I forgot to clean the horse's hooves. In all the excitement, I just plumb forgot, he declared. Oh, great, Mr. Memory is going to make us late for the fair stated Betty Sue. I thought boys were faster and better, Johnny, said his twin. Enough, Betty Sue. It was just an accident. Go on, boy, and do your duty. We will wait for you here, said Mama. Hold on there, boy, and plant yourself back in your seat, stated Papa. Well, you were feeding the horses. I saw how hard you were working, so I took it upon myself to lend a hand and clean up their hooves, informed Papa. So, what do you say we just go down this here road and find that fair? Asked Papa. Thank you, Papa, declared little Johnny as he gave his father a giant hug. Chapter 2 After what seemed forever, the family finally made it to the fair, just as the park was about to open. Dad drove the vehicle around the lot until he found a place to park his oversized long car. Here we go. We can park right here. Next to that, what in tarnation is that? asked Papa. That tiny thing looks like a car, but I am not sure, said Papa. I think I saw something like that in the circus, and ten or twenty clowns got out of it, said Papa, laughing. Finally, the Cadillac came to a halt. Then Dad placed the parking brake 
and off they went. As he walked up to the ticket booth, Papa pulled out the piece of paper he had been saving in a shirt pocket. Then he passed the paper to the man that was sitting behind the booth. Papa had a giant grin across his face. Why is Dad smiling, Mama? asked Betty Sue. He's got a coupon, baby, replied Mama. Oh, nodded Betty Sue. She knew how much Papa loved a bargain. Well, let me see here. This paper says, free entrance to the fair. So free it is, said the man. Thank you, sir, said little Johnny. What a polite boy you have there, mister. And that kind of manners deserves a reward. So here are four bands to ride all the rides. It's on me. Welcome to the Maricopa Fair, stated the kindly man. Dad was about to jump out of his shoes when he noticed that the mayor was about to cut the ribbon and start the festival. Thank you very much, sir, Mama said to the man, smiling. You are so welcome, lovely lady. It makes my heart sing to see a good American family have a great day, replied the man. And in conclusion, I would like to say Maricopa County and the city of Phoenix would like to welcome you to our fair. Have a fun-filled day said the mayor as he cut the ribbon. Then the herd of people headed to the entrance gates. After what seemed forever, the family finally entered the fairgrounds. Well, family, what should we do first? asked Papa. We can afford to go on any ride you like, he said. Of course, Daddy, that is because a nice man gave us free passes, added Betty Sue. Yep, Betty Sue, and that means we have extra money for the games and carnival food, replied Papa. So, what should we do first? asked Mama. How about the screamer, Mama? asked Johnny. I think I will pass on that one, answered Mama. As the three brave souls waited in line, Mama entered into another line in order to purchase everyone a corn dog. Hello, Mrs. What can I get for you? asked the attendant. Could I buy four corn dogs, three sodas, and a coffee, please? asked Mama. No, Mrs. You can't buy them, but I can get them for you. You see, you have today's golden passes. That means even the food is included in your visit, replied the gentleman. Really? inquired Mama. Yipper, stated the man. You see, every year Mr. Farnsworth gives away a fair experience. It is given to a worthy family, a family that is kind, friendly, and expresses good Christian values. I see this year it is your family, said the man, smiling. Oh, thank you, kind sir, said Mother, crying. This has been a particularly difficult year on the farm, and they really could not afford to be visiting the fair at this time. This is both a blessing and a miracle, expressed Mama. You are very welcome. I now can see that Mr. Farnsworth made the right choice, said the attendant. By the way, I am George, George Ibanez, he replied. I am very pleased to meet you, Mr. Ibanez. I am Vivian, Vivian Johnstone. Please call me Viv, replied Mama. May I help you with this, Mrs. Vivian? inquired Mr. Ibanez. Then he reached for the boxes that held the sodas and corn dogs. As the pair walked down the line, they met up with Papa, Johnny, and Betty Sue. Papa noticed that Mama was crying, but she was neither sad nor hurt. Why are you crying, Mama? Did something bad happen? asked little Johnny. No, baby, something wonderful. I will tell you later, replied Mama. Honey, this is Mr. Ibanez, and he is in charge of the concession stands, introduced Mama. Well, hello there, Mr. Ibanez. It is a privilege to make your acquaintance, stated Papa as he reached out his hand in a gesture of friendship. Well, actually, I am the first assistant to Mr. Farnsworth, the owner of the fair, and he asked me to escort his chosen throughout the park, stated Mr. Ibanez. Then he shook Papa's hand. Well, this is an indeed an honor, sir. Please, call me Steve, said Papa. But your name is Papa. Papa, said little Johnny. Papa just laughed. 
Why did Mr. Farnsworth choose our family for this honor, Mr. Ibanez? asked Papa. Mr. Ibanez sighed and began to explain. You see, Mr. Farnsworth has been in the carnival business for over 40 years. He comes from a family tradition of carnies. He loves to entertain families, particularly children. As America's social mores and values have crumbled, he became a little disillusioned by the people's attitudes, he stated. Yes, most people have some degree of social grace, but it seems that every year society's manners have been diminishing, he continued. So, a few years ago, Mr. Farnsworth decided to search for families that would renew his faith in human nature. He searched for those who expressed the social pleasantries which he learned when he was a boy, continued Mr. Ibanez. He is a strong proponent of God, family, and country. It is his creed. As a Christian, he noticed all the struggles that plague mankind. He decided then and there to make at least one special family his fair guests each year. I can tell that your family is a genuine article, and everything that he looks for, said Mr. Ibanez. Well, I don't see anything special about us. I cannot begin to fathom just why he chose us, stated Papa. That is exactly why you are special. It is exactly why he chose you. Today, most families are so self-centered, caring only for their particular interest. And Mr. Farnsworth knows that for society to truly flourish, mankind must maintain a mutual interest in one another, just like the Holy Bible teaches. Chapter 3 Little boy, little girl, do you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? asked Mr. Ibanez. I think so, said Johnny. No, sir, said Betty Sue. Papa just smiled. <laughs> you are our kind of people, he said. Well, the story is found in the Bible's New Testament, and Christ himself gives us a tale. It starts... There was a man who was injured, and most likely robbed. This man was from the tribe of Judah, in the land of Jerusalem. He was a Jew, and in his own country. This injured man, this Jew, was laying in the street's gutter, bleeding and groaning in pain. Now this was not a small, isolated street where no one ever passed. This was Main Street, where everyone had to go through. In this story, four men witnessed the man's agony and it is important to see how each man reacted to it. The first man which passed was a Pharisee. A Pharisee was like the mayor over there, a strong leader, but he was also the town pastor. So, people expected this Pharisee to be a man of God, who acted in the ways of God. So, this Pharisee on the other side of the street saw the man, crying in pain. What do you think he did, little girl? Mr. Ibanez asked. Of course, he went to help this poor man. He is a man of God. God would help this man, right? Inquired Betty Sue. Eh, one would think so, miss. But unfortunately, this was not the case. This religious leader pretended not to see the man and kept going, leaving the injured victim in his agony. The second man who passed was a scribe. Now these were like your church elders. They were called to be watchmen. They had the responsibility to ensure that the church did not stray from the laws and traditions that God created. So, young master, what do you think this man did? asked Mr. Ibanez. Well, that's easy. He went and helped the man, called an ambulance and took him to the hospital, right? After all, this is a leader in the church, a watchman, stated little Johnny. 
Well, you would think so. Again, this is not the case. This watchman decided that he was not going to help this fellow brother, or in today's case, his fellow Christian. He too pretends not to see the man and walked right over him. <laughs> At least he did not step on him. But he failed to exhibit any compassion, love, or empathy. He only expresses a loathing sentiment toward his fellow brother, says Mr. Ibanez. How horrible! At least Christians today would not do this, said Betty. I hate to disagree with you, miss. Unfortunately, today this is the norm in Christianity, rather than the exception. The next passerby was a member of the injured man's church. He was not a leader, a minister, or an elder, but he did hold an office in his church. He might have been a deacon. As a fellow church member, he did have some duty to his fellow brother. So what do you think happened, little master? asked Mr. Ibanez. <laughs> I'm afraid to answer. It really seems that this church is in real need of reform, sir. I just do not know. I guess I am going to say someone in the church finally helped this man, right? asked Johnny. I am sorry. Your faith in this church member was misplaced. This deacon not only refused to help the injured brother, as he passed over him, he screamed at him, murmured about him, and criticized him for being a spectacle in the community. He called him a bum and said that he should find a job. He then told him stop being a parasite on society. The poor injured man could say nothing to defend himself. He could only lie there, moaning, crying, agonizing in pain with no hope of relief, said Mr. Ibanez. This... The story is too sad. I really hope that it is not reflective of human nature. I hope that it is just fiction, said Betty Sue with a tear in her eye. Please don't cry. I had no intention of causing you emotional pain. Please forgive an old man's ignorance, said Mr. Ibanez. No, sir, it is not you. It is me. If this is the ways of our world, where is the hope? cried Betty Sue. Hold on, sweet child. Just wait a minute. Let me finish the story. Finally comes the fourth man, says Mr. Ibanez. Oh, no, I don't think that I can take this any more, sir. But I promise to wait till you're done, said Betty Sue, tears pouring out of her eyes. Finally comes the fourth man. But this man was different. First, he was not a Jew. He was not a member of the injured man's church. He was a stranger from a strange land. Second, he was of a different religion, and maybe even a different race. This man was a Samaritan. Now the Samaritans were treated very poorly during these times by the Hebrews. They were treated as second-class citizens, and were often shunned from Jewish society. So, what do you think happened? asked Mr. Ibanez. Well, that's easy. If a group of people treated me like that, I would probably hate them, although I would hopefully ask God to remove my hate, exclaimed Johnny, as he noticed his father's displeased face upon hearing the comment. You would think so, but that is not what happened. This man, this Samaritan, was on the opposite side of the street. He then walked across the street to see what had happened. This Samaritan who owed this injured Jewish man no duty, examined the man and helped him to his feet. The Samaritan, who was not a member of this man's congregation, took him and placed him at a local hotel or hospital for aid. This Samaritan, who was a stranger, had nothing to gain by being kind. He not only paid for the injured man's medical care and boarding, but he also promised to pay any remaining balance the man acquired while healing upon his return. Remember, the man was most likely robbed and had no way of paying for his own care, stated Mr. Ibanez. So no one who owed their brother a duty of love showed any kindness toward him, but rather this stranger who owed him nothing gave him what should have been given to him by his own people? Inquired Johnny. You got it, Master Johnny, replied Mr. Ibanez. I do not get it. Why did Jesus tell this story? asked the puzzled Betty Sue. Well, my dear, 
The answer is in the words that your brother spoke. You see, the Hebrews in Christ's day believed themselves to be special, and they were, but not for the reasons they perceived. This nation was special because they were given the oracles of truth by God, along with the responsibility of sharing them with others. Knowledge invokes a responsibility. The ruling caste were filled with bigotry, selfishness, arrogance, and a sense of superiority, and these sentiments trickled down to the laity. For this reason, the religious leaders decided not to fulfill their God-given duty and share the truth with the world. Failure to do as God commands is a sin, and their lack of love for others was also a sin. The Samaritans, who were their distant cousins, family were shunned from this blessing by keeping them in ignorance. It was perceived that since the Samaritans did not possess the entire truth, that God would not show them favor, as he did with the Jewish nation. Therefore, this induced ignorance was a means of suppression, isolation, and corruption. This was obviously not what God had intended when he made the covenant with Abraham. Jehovah's people, as you correctly assume, Miss Betty Sue, were supposed to act, just like the one they claimed to follow. The people of Judah should have been sharing this truth with the world, but they refused and sinned against God. Again, Christ commands his followers, those who claim his name, to go and teach all nations. But today, the world's leaders are attempting to make laws, prohibiting Christians from sharing the love of God. They call these laws hate speech statutes, is it any wonder why we have lost our way as a nation? asked Mr. Ibanez. At that moment, Mr. Farnsworth walked up to the group. Well, I see you were in line to ride the coaster. Do you mind if I join you? he asked. It would be an honor, sir, replied Papa. Yes, sir, please do, said Johnny. So, you were talking about the... Mr. Farnsworth's words were interrupted. The Good Samaritan, blurted out Betty Sue. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I did not mean to interrupt you, said the embarrassed little girl. Mr. Farnsworth could not help but smile. What a well-mannered family. What respectful children. They honor you, Mr. and Mrs. Johnstone, by their actions, said the impressed carnival owner. Please continue, George, said Mr. Farnsworth. Christ was trying to teach these Jewish people that, although most of their actions followed the commandments of God, their intentions for keeping them were not consistent, with hidden reasons for promoting them. They were keeping the commandments for personal gain, not out of the love and devotion to God and his children. This falsified intention, personal gain, combated God's reason for giving the laws. Their purpose went from true selfless love, known as agape, to false self-love or hedonism. God's professed people had become pagan in their intentions. They changed the meaning and therefore reasons of the law, said Mr. Ibanez. I thought that they were not supposed to change anything that God has given us, especially not his word, laws, or statutes, stated Johnny. This time Johnny's got it, said Mr. Ibanez. These two children are well-versed in biblical precepts, Mr. Farnsworth, stated George. I can see that. I guess they truly are the right family to honor. A family who honors God, said Mr. Farnsworth. So, why are we in line, George? asked Mr. Farnsworth. Gold wrist members are God's children, and they go to the front of the line, he declared. Of course, you are correct, sir. We had started talking, eating, and drinking. And the time just passed us by, George said.
Chapter 4 As the little band reached the front of the line, the ride attendant asked those ahead to please step aside. He opened the gate and greeted the group. Hello, Mr. Farnsworth, Mr. Ibanez, and Johnstone family. Welcome to the Screamer. Please board the first two carts, rows one through three, said the attendant. As the remaining cars were filled, everyone raised their arms over their heads, and the safety bars were brought down over them. Clank went the brake release, and the coaster propelled into action. Mr. Farnsworth raised his hands over his head, followed by Papa, Johnny, and Betty Sue. Mama just screamed, and Mr. Ibanez laughed. After the small company rode every ride, and some twice, Mr. Farnsworth invited everyone to eat dinner. At dinner, they were met by Mrs. Farnsworth and Mrs. Ibanez. Everyone had a wonderful time. The children were on their absolute best behavior, and Mrs. Farnsworth and Mrs. Ibanez were extremely impressed with them. I want to thank you, Mr. Farnsworth, from the bottom of my heart for this special day. We could not have afforded to enjoy such a fun-filled time at your fair, and I have no way to repay your kindness. I really don't know why you chose our family for this honor, sir, stated Papa. I chose you because you are worthy, Mr. Johnstone. You are not worthy of yourselves, but rather because of the one you choose to follow. Your Savior, Christ Jesus, makes you worthy, stated Mr. Farnsworth. How did you know that we are Christians, sir? asked Papa. That was easy. I knew you by your works, your mannerisms, your love for one another, and your respect of humanity, replied Mr. Farnsworth. As this world becomes more corrupt, it becomes easier and easier to spot a child of God. It took about five seconds to see that your children respect their elders and honor the parents. What are the Ten Commandments and God's holy law? stated Mr. Farnsworth. But how does that make us worthy over all these other families? inquired Papa. Because, Steve, as a Christian, you are a child of God. As a fellow child of God, I have a duty to love my brother. You and your family are not customers. You are family. You are my brother. It is my duty to love you. Once I recognized you, I loved you. It is that simple, said Mr. Farnsworth. Welcome to the family, said George. As tears rolled down Mrs. Johnstone's face, a gleam of gratitude beamed from her eyes. Thank you, Jesus. I knew you would not let us down. You have removed our worries and fears, just as you promised, she said. As the family drove away in their long, old Cadillac, Mama and Papa waved and said farewell to the new family. Betty Sue, fast asleep with her head lodged on her brother's shoulder. Little Johnny caressed her hair and kissed his twin's forehead goodnight. Papa, looking in the rearview mirror, realizing the blessings he had just experienced, gave thanks and prayer. Mr. Farnsworth, waving, cried out, Don't forget to come back tomorrow! This has been Little Johnny Goes to the Fair, written by Samuel E. Sanchez, narrated by Frank Block. Copyright 2021 by Sanchez Family Publishing. Production copyright by Sanchez Family Publishing.